Yeah, I'm Brandon Richards, the general manager for Asia for Neo4j, based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Salam sejahtera, kawan-kawan di Malaysia. Kami Daniel Ng, uh, Vice President of Marketing for Neo4j uh, Asia Pacific, based in Singapore. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, so the relational database transformed business. Uh, companies were able to collect a lot more data, put it on applications like their ERP, CRM, HC, you know, all, all kinds of different applications. And it was a, a marvel of modern engineering, right? Um, but I think people came, a, came to a point where they said, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, it was very good at certain things but they had to find ways around, to engineer around problems. And uh, so that's where we kind of got the, the income, the incoming of all of the NoSQL databases. Uh, and this is basically purpose-built databases to, to handle a particular problem that relational databases weren't good at handling. Um, I think there was a point where connected data specifically became it's still a major problem. All the NoSQL databases were still using kind of the traditional techniques and 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 figuring out how how to connect data. So uh, graph databases came uh, as a part of that, right, to address this problem and weakness of relational databases and other NoSQL databases. Um, and and this process has created a a huge transformation in organizations being able to now ask questions that they just couldn't ask before of their data. Uh, and so data uh, previously was just discrete data points. Uh, now they're realizing the connections in the data are just as important and valuable as data sources. And we need to get um, leverage that in, in our organization for better insight and, uh, and, and making better decisions. If I may compliment what uh, Brandon has said, I think um, I've been in, in this industry for 38 years. Um, I've seen it evolve from the MIPS of millions of instructions per second. The younger generation probably doesn't know that acronym, uh, but I came from that uh, you know, era. Uh, and what we've seen is, is from a data evolution standpoint, um, we all know that the world produces data every second. What we're doing today, recording this interview, is data being produced, right? And when you kind of look at the explosion of social media and the internet, that actually fuels the whole production of data, right? Then it went through a whole series of, of uh, moves and motion where it says, how do I collect data in a single place when you have now moved from structured data to unstructured data, right? What is unstructured data? IoT signals, uh, photographs, Nasi Lemak that I took picture of this morning and I posted on Facebook, that's unstructured, right? As opposed to structured data where you fill up a a form uh, when you apply for your insurance policy, right? 30, you know, everyone, you know, doesn't really understand why are these squares when we fill out forms? And that's like 30, you know, characters of name, 60 characters of, uh, of uh, you know, address and one character of gender and seven characters of, of phone numbers. That's structured because the computer expects it to be like that for every record, right? And, and, and now you have to for example, somebody bump into you at Kursas Highway and you come down, you take a picture and you want to now claim insurance. How do you associate the unstructured data of that photo to the structured data of your insurance claim? I think that's a huge challenge, right? And now the birth of multiple databases. Uh, and we are all talking about speed in the internet world. How do you associate that together is going to be a huge challenge you know, from a speed standpoint. And then you get scalability problems because you're not talking about three people, you're talking about three million people, 30 million people in Malaysia, for example, comes connected data, which Brandon brought, brought up, where we need to make sense of the relationship between, you know, candidate A, candidate B, in COVID contact tracing, a bad, good example in that mm -hmm. sense, right? We need to find out who is near who, that has walked past who, that came close to food that has COVID. And you can't do that over the course of two weeks because in the tables of rows and columns, you take a lot of time to do that, which is the relational 
database that Ryzen talked about. But graphs actually build the relationship between all those data points, and you can know it immediately, almost, and be able to take action. Right? So, so there are many, many great examples as the world moves from generational data to collected data mm -hmm. to connected data, where applications can now look at how we can use the relationship between data points to unveil the gems of knowledge within those data, mm -hmm. right? And we've proven it so many times, right? With yeah. Panama Papers, with Pandora Papers, um, COVID contact tracing, fraud detection applications, uh, to be able to show to the world, you know, what the use of connected data and the use of graph data platform is. And guess what? We're just beginning, mm -hmm. right? You want to take me to take that first? Then sure. we partner. Yeah, brother. <laughs> Who says they're not jumping on it? <laughs> they are. That's what I would say. Right? That's right. <laughs> and I think Brendan and I, on a daily basis, frankly, on an hourly basis, talk to prospects who, you know, at the, at the start of every new technology, there's always this learning curve. What is it? Mm -hmm. Right? When new 4 j first started, Brendan, you and I know this uh, last year. The question is, what is graph data platform and who is Neo4j? Uh, just to add a little bit of comic to it, people actually came to me and say, Neo4j sounds like a password. <laughs> and we go like, yeah, it is. It's a password to the locked data, uh, to the lock, uh, uh, you know, the value of the data that is yeah. that, that you have. So, you know, I'm going to let Brandon fill in the blanks here, but um, they are jumping on it. Um, you know, we've spent one year um, sharing with the marketplace in Asia Pacific on graph data platform and, you know, progressing to knowledge graph. Um, people who see the value is jumping on it and cer certainly everyone is seeing the value. Why? Last statement is a logical step to uncovering value from your data. And it is a mind map of where your data should be going, right? In terms of finding out what I don't know, then finding out the answer to now what I know that I used to not know, and then come up with better solutions for the customer. Yeah, I, I absolutely back up what Daniel said about <laughs> companies are jumping at knowledge graphs. We, we, are, we are inundated with people who are very interested, who are starting to use uh, knowledge graphs in a wide range of use cases. Very often they'll start with our free version, the community version, which is uh, you know open source. They can come and start playing with it. In fact, we're finding all the time organizations that we're going into thinking they've never heard of knowledge graph and they're using a, our community version for some project within the uh, organization. So, uh, I think I think companies are. I think one of the areas that has led to a broader awareness in APAC is uh, Gartner's top 10 trends in data and analytics. Uh, in the last three years in a row, graph has been one of those top 10 trends. I think for organizations that actually read the report, they find that uh, even though graph is only one of the 10, they're talking about graph throughout the entire report. <laughs> And I found that really, really interesting, yep. you know, when they're talking about explainable AI or, or uh, data fabric or blockchain, all of the, all these sections were talking about how they can leverage graph to do certain things. So graph was enabling a lot of the other areas, uh, a lot of the other trends that were in their top 10 trends. So I kind of view graph as one of those super trends yep. that's enabling you to do all the things you want to do and data and analytics. So uh, forward thinking organizations, they're thinking, how can we leverage data? How can we get insight? They're going to analysts like Gartner and trying to figure out what, uh, what are they saying about where we should uh, spend our effort or how we should um, get more value out of our data. And they're getting pointed to knowledge graphs. Yep. So I, I, think, I think that it's happening. What are the blockers right now? I think, I think it's partly, just educating 
you know, what, what is a knowledge graph? How do I, how do I uh, uh, implement that within our organization? How do we get more comfortable with it? How do we improve our skill sets? But uh, generally speaking, um, it's, it's one of the benefits of graph is that it is very easy to pick up. So at the developer level, at the practitioner level, data science level, they're able to quickly come in, uh, learn no in code. a day. No code. No code. They can learn in a day what, what the basics are and, uh, and, and really get started. So um, I, I, think, I think they are jumping at that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, you want me to sure. take the first stab? <laughs> um, so definitely financial services, you have things like uh, um, fraud detection, anti-money laundering type use cases, uh, risk management, uh, understanding complex entities, things that are, are you know real connected data problems. Uh, I want to stop the fraud before it happens. I need to automate that process and look for you know, any, you know, these 10 patterns in four milliseconds or less, right? Uh, so those types of use cases, and, and along those lines, you have, you have things like cybersecurity type of use cases. Um, uh, then you go into manufacturing. They really want to understand these complex supply chains where you're linking together all these different uh, uh, processes or you know, what's our bill of materials look like or uh, what's, I want a complete view of my product, which can be very, uh, very complex. So those are, those are some of those types of, of use cases. Um, we also see making a difference in organizations like uh, uh, NASA, you know, getting to Mars faster, two years faster, because they were using knowledge graphs to answer questions that uh, they, they, uh, they knew existed. Um, other ones would be uh, a, lot, a lot going on in healthcare, um, you know, personalizing healthcare, uh, figuring out uh, uh, you know who are similar people with similar paths, uh, and how do we um, how do we optimize outcomes for these patients, right? So when you find similar people who've gone through similar things and what treatments and what uh, you know what things work well for them, we can start to make uh, optimizations. So there's there's a lot going on in healthcare. Uh, I've already talked about manufacturing, financial services. Um, a lot in the, uh, the retail side. So recommendation engines, hyper-personalization, uh, dynamic pricing engines, all of these types of things are uh, coming back to kind of that real time. I need information in real time that's complex and connected and to be able to make quick, quick, or even automate decisions. So I, I think we see those types of examples. Um, if you've booked a flight recently, Almost certainly, uh, Neo4j was used as a part of that process. Um, if you send a parcel someplace, uh, almost certainly Neo4j is used in routing calculations and uh, you know those kinds of use cases. Yeah, I don't you, know. You buy a book at Amazon. <laughs> buy a book at Amazon, you're going to probably. You know, you, you get the people who bought this bought this book as well. Guess who's that? That's us, right? In the back end, right? So, so I think only one thing I would like to add. Um, we're not industry specific, we're use case specific. So when Brandon talked about fraud detection, many people will jump and say, banking. We go like, yeah, but guess what? Who else is coming to us? Um, online gaming companies. So in the COVID situation where you can't go and have fun at the casino, you do it online. When that happens, a lot more fraud happens. Yeah. And uh, lately, you know, for your retail example, um, we also see people coming to us and go like, you know, we're a retail outlet or retail portal. Can you help us with fraud detection? Yeah. And, you know, for me, I scratch my head and say, you're not a bank. Um, and and the te teachers need to say, hey, it's a use case that's horizontal. You see applications in different industry. So we're more use case first, industry second in that yeah. sense versus a aware of banking solution. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Can I jump on that one? Sure. Yeah. I know you want to. <laughs> um, 
Well, look, we love the fact that a lot of organizations, a lot of companies are jumping into the graph space. If anything, it validates that uh, it's real. This is, this is here to stay, and it's, it's going to be a big thing. Um, with that, we have a lot of work, new, new companies trying to jump into the space. I think the first thing they all do is they point towards performance, speed. We need to be fast. We need to be faster than anyone else. Uh, at Neo4j, one of the big lessons we've learned is that uh, reliability, data reliability, especially in a graph, is critical. So if, if uh, you expect you know, a, a database to, to store data, retrieve data, and keep that data safe. And if it's not keeping the data safe, that's a major issue. Um, with, with everyone focusing too much on performance, oftentimes that comes at the cost of data reliability. And so that's, that's one of the big uh, issues. We, we see almost every company that's getting into the space is so hyper-focused on performance and scalability that they leave this third and critical part behind. So uh, for us, we see um, being able to keep data safe and uh, not corrupt your database is, is critical. Now, in a graph database, data corruption would be a much bigger problem than in any other type of data store. Uh, I'll illustrate it this way. Suppose I corrupt one piece of data uh, in a relational data store. The only query that's going to impact is a query that's looking for that particular piece of corrupted data. In a graph database, uh, if you corrupt one piece of data, it's going to corrupt any query that goes touches that piece of data. I want to know the shortest path between this and this. Well, your answer will be wrong. Uh, and so it, it can impact thousands of queries, not just a single query. So corruption in a graph database is devastating. And it, it, it's absolutely unacceptable. So what our focus has been from an engineering standpoint is ensuring that we are hyper-focused on we will go as fast as we can without sacrificing reliability. We will scale as much as we can without sacrificing reliability. But if it ever is a trade-off, we're always going to pick reliability. So I think that comes with the maturity of, of the one who came in first. <laughs> uh, everyone else has not learned that lesson, or they're learning that lesson very quickly as they get into real production environments. And companies are saying, wait a second, our data needs to be safe. And if you can't keep our data safe, uh, we see it it's as useless. It, it, yeah, it can't yeah. be a proper production environment uh, you know, for most organizations. They just won't, won't stand for that. So I think that would be the one key thing that if I was a, looking into the graph space, I would very much, yes, you want performance, and yes, you want scalability, but I need to also be checking for data reliability. And I would also add to that, just because a company says their data is, is secure and that they are uh, an ACID compliant database doesn't mean it is. You have to test it. So, and, and your, your uh, uh, POCs and things <laughs> like that absolutely test for data reliability because that's, that's critical. And Brendan's being humble, right? Besides the uh, data security piece, um, we are performing very well in the scalability oh, and the performance side, sure. right? We have proven uh, using real data that we uh, could process 1.2 trillion, not billion, 1.2 trillion relationship, sub 20 milliseconds. Yeah. Now, talk to me about scale and talk to me about performance, right? So I'll leave yeah, it at If I could add one last <laughs> thing, Daniel, I would just say uh, our, our real customers in the real world are using massive graphs at massive scale massive performance. So just because a, a vendor will run a performance benchmark and somehow theirs comes out, you know, we get all kinds of claims, a thousand times faster or whatever, uh, almost always it's, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, pretty much garbage. <laughs> that's, what, that's where he found. He will quote you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, look, our presence, we're growing as a company faster in APAC than in any other region in the world. So we are uh, growing at a very rapid pace. Uh, we have, uh, we're hiring at a very rapid pace. If you know someone, uh, <laughs> if you know <laughs> someone that uh, has, has skills that we can leverage, I'm sure we'd be interested. But we, we are growing at a very fast pace. We're adding 
lots of, of big company brands that everyone would recognize. Uh, you know, companies like uh, here in Malaysia, Air Asia, um, you know, has, has migrated. They, you know, wanting to um, find an innovative way of delivering more personalized uh, service to their customers. Um, and you've got big banks. We've, we've talked about a lot of the big banks in the region uh, are, are also jumping at the, at the opportunity to leverage this. So uh, we're seeing a huge adoption in banks, governments, um, manufacturers, uh, retailers, uh, you name gaming it. Company. Gaming companies, uh, life science. Uh, there's, there's, they're, they're all jumping on the opportunity. And I think there's, uh, I, I think that speaks to the fact that APAC is ready for grab. Uh, the only thing I want to add is, is New Project believes in managed growth. Uh, we're not a company that comes in here and hire 20 people this year and fire 15 the next year. Uh, we have to have a sustainable business uh, for the sake of the market that we serve, for the sake of the customers that we serve, for the sake of the partners um, that we that we collaborate with, and more importantly, for the sake of the nodes. We call ourselves nodes yeah. in the graph, in the APEC graph. Um, to be fair and to be you know uh, uh, um, respectful of, of them. So as Brandon says, we grow in leaps and bounds. It is grown within the context of will the business be sustainable uh, yeah. in you know the next three, five, 10, 20 years. And, um, and with that in mind, we grew the company many, many times uh, in 2021. Well, firstly, I'm humbled and grateful and uh, to some of them surprised <laughs> that actually people know that I exist uh, in, this, in this world. Uh, but it really is a testament of 38 years of, uh, of contribution and also learning from the marketplace, you know, working with great colleagues like Brandon and, and you know, tons of good friends in the marketplace. They always say that the guy that you know, the girl that wins the award is the one standing on stage, but they don't see the whole village of people that stands behind the person um, to get them to where it is. So, you know, I think, you know, that is what it is. It's a reflection of not just me, but a lot of the support um, that I've been getting, um, a lot of the uh, recognition uh, from companies like New 4 uh, that, that, you know, I've received. And um, very importantly, um, my mantra is to learn to contribute and to be happy doing the first two. And the rest is the rest, I guess. It's, it's well deserved. <laughs> Thank I you. can assure you. Thank it's, you. It's, it's Thank you. Excellent work. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about graphs today and, and uh, you know, what's happening here at APAC. And I look forward to answering people's questions or helping them on this graph journey. That's what we're here for. So, terima kasih. To all the sahabat and kawan-kawan di Malaysia and also Indonesia, I'm sure this will reach there. And thank you very much for um, AOPG for hosting us today. I mean, it's been great. I think last note is, is open up your mind. Um, there is a bigger world out there for your data. Um, it could be a fabulous world that integrates everything, but be very careful and prepared that you actually will find things that you may not like. <laughs> that you also may find things that you love, like many of our customers, uh, but we provide you the technology for you to find things. And through that exploration, you will actually see um, what you have, what you don't have, and at the same time, make decisions on how you will progress that. Um, you know, lastly, try to make graph a humanized technology, apply it from a mind mapping and a logic thinking perspective. Um, and I think with that, um, everyone will prosper. And as Brandon says, feel free to contact us, uh, APAC at new4j.com if you like. Um, and uh, new4j.com um, will be your source of uh, information for a lot of these things. Uh, thank you so much, AOPG, for helping us do this and for letting us talk to your audience. Thank you.